So once again, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. Today's webinar is Canola Stand Establishment and Getting the Crop Off to a Great Start. Our main presenter is Doug Moisey, a Senior Agronomy Specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. Also on the line is Aaron Brock, our Agronomy Specialist with the Canola Council of Canada, based in the Peace River region. And I'll turn things over to Doug here. Okay. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, first time trying this, so it might be a little bit different view or different way than me standing up and walking back and forth across the room. But one of the things is when Rick had asked me to do this, I thought this would be a great opportunity to get everybody to start thinking about things that are going to be coming up here in the next couple of weeks that we have to start thinking about. And hopefully as agronomists out there and producers that are out there too what, listening to this today, as I start thinking about what we can do here to try to improve this 50 to 60% level. Uh, last spring we experienced a lot of issues because of the cold growing season. Uh, at La Nina or El Nino here this spring here, we've got some pretty warm temperatures now and I know even a few guys here the last couple of days are talking about pulling out the drills here pretty quick, so let's start thinking about some things. So, so Doug, this morning here, we're, yes? Uh, we're not seeing your screen at this point. What the heck's going on here? Oh, here we go. Are you seeing it now? Yep. You see it? Yep, there we go. Good thing you caught that, Rick. Okay, so on with the show here, sort of. So let's get going with this. One of the things I would say is is that it is still a 50 to 60 percent rule. And one of the things that I would like to start on here, just hold on, Rick. We're having trouble here switching for some reason. Click on the on the PowerPoint screen, and then it'll make it your active. Oh, maybe menu. that's what I'm doing. There. All right. Go oh, see the few few glitches. Um, the biggest thing still is, no matter what we have for the best varieties out there, we have some probably the most top end genetics I've seen in the last 15 years coming to the market in the last couple of years. It's still a high seeding mortality, and it's because of its small seed size. And this mortality is inconsistent, and and it's because of the small seed that size and this inconsistency that we sometimes see a lot of stands that you know just aren't what we we're hoping to be. Uh, average conditions, you know, we probably see that 40 to 60 percent emergence. And these poor emergence can be in multiple factors, seeding speed, dry soils, soil temperatures, plus a myriad of other little things. So things we need to be thinking about for this season here that I feel we have to be thinking about, where are we at? And as far as most parts of Western Canada, some places were, complete, were, a lot, were dry, and we have to be thinking about how dry were we in our fields last year, and our herbicides are an issue. Now, uh, typically we shouldn't be seeing some issues, but there is concern out there that, you know, with the drier summer that we had and the drier fall, we didn't get the herbicide breakdown that we were hoping to. Um, do we, do we, how is our straw residue? It was an issue in 2009 in regard to stand establishment. Is it going to be this year? Are you pushing the limbs of fertilizer with the seed this year? Being that we have a lot of areas right now where I'm not seeing much snow out there, the snow has melted away. I've had a lot of comments from producers saying is that, uh, they've got enough moisture to get the crop going, but is it enough to really get it going? And so are we pushing that limits? How soon do you plan to seed and what's the soil temperature and how fast do you plan to seed? Things that we need to be thinking about coming up this year. And going back, you guys have seen this, many people have seen this, but the idea is to re-emphasize that there are probably about 69 production factors affecting the emergence of your canola crop. We're trying to target 7 to 14 plants per square foot on average. The thing here we have to be thinking about at the end of the day is we still are trying to target 10 plants, but there are a lot of different little things that can affect from crop residues, uh, herbicide residues, pests, and your seeding practices. Probably one of the most controllable things are seeding practices, from seeding depth to seeding date to herbicides, uh, seeding method, and things like that. The first thing we have to start thinking about here is that at the end of the day, we have to be keeping a sample. Seed pickup days are starting to come up here pretty quick here. A lot of the companies are saying, come on down, pick up your samples. This is the idea is pick up that seed, get it home, take some samples. Uh, what we're recommending is, is a minimum of at least two cup sample of all crops sown. It doesn't matter if it's wheat, barley, canola, should be, sown, uh, should be kept 
on hand. If you've got one lot number of canola, for example, and you're gonna be using it across all your acres, just to grab enough like two cups from a take some samples from some different bags. They should be stored in a Ziploc bag or use a sample bag from a registered seed laboratory. Label these samples with the information on the seed lot and includes, uh, include also your uh, blue certified seed tag with the sample. The big trick here though is ensure that they're stored in a, in a nice cool dry place in a rodent proof container. Keep it away from direct sunlight and white temperature fluctuations and keep those on hand. Not saying that there's going to be potentially any problems but the idea being is that if something does show up what we do want to make sure is, is that we do have a sample on hand. So again the idea is keep a good sample for this year. And this is, helps us as agronomists if you phone us up and you have some issues showing up on your fields where you're maybe not getting emergence that you'd like to see. Or, for example, if you have a couple of different varieties uh, or I say maybe the same variety with a couple of different seed loss and you're seeing some differences, unless we have some samples, there's really no way to backtrack on what potentially could be happening. But I think the next thing that you have to be thinking about here is now with this warmer weather, we have to start thinking about what we should be doing at the shop. And, and right now is probably one of the better opportunities is that if you've got a heated shop or with the way it's getting warmer here, start going through the drill. And from the opener aspect, there's a number of times every year as agronomists from the, in, our, in our staff, we see problems where openers are sometimes worn and so you don't get that seed to, uh, fertilizer separation. Uh, we see sometimes is maybe that seed shelf doesn't completely get built properly and so that seed doesn't actually sit on the shelf. So the idea is to look at those openers, make sure that they're they're in good top end shape. The other thing is to be checking about too is, is that, for example, on your wings of your of your drills is that are the bushings okay? Is they not worn? I've had one case where a producer mentioned to me that last year the bushings were worn out on some, some of his wings there where the actual drill was not running straight down the field, it was running at an angle, so there were some issues that way. Go through your air seals uh, on your tanks. Rotate your hoses. Uh, we had an air drill clinic the last couple of years where uh, you, they were recommending that you should be rotating your, your air hoses at least a quarter turn per year. Check the underside of uh, your caps on your Venturi towers for some of the older drills. But one of the, probably the more important things to be thinking about here is front to back and side to side level. Making sure that your drills are level properly and then looking also make sure that your tire inflation is proper because even if your tire inflation is out a little bit, that will actually set the difference in the drill. Because remember, we're still trying to target a very small seed into a very precise place. The other thing is too is now with the new independent packing pressure that are being made available with some of the newer drills, we need to be thinking about is how much pressure is too much pressure. Uh, for example, last year, one guy mentioned to me because there was a crusting issue, is that he could see actually a sheen in the row as he was seeding behind him, and it was actually from basics being packed too high. So the idea is think about those kind of things here as we're sitting there at the shop. This is what we're going to be targeting now. I say now this is from a, of a very dry year going to spring in one area in northwestern Saskatchewan. Uh, this is a guy's where he actually slowed from 5 miles an hour down to 4.2 and you can see how nice a uniform stand is because this is where we want to be at. This is the kind of stand we're hoping to get. And it didn't take much to do it. He says this was some of the better stands he's ever had in his fields and this is from the simple fact of just doing one little thing, slowing down. And probably what you can see here is that you see how nice and uniform the emergence is and knows how well and nicely spaced these plants are. So a little Freudian thing on the right-hand side, you'll see that in the ruler it says higher yields guaranteed. We can see that the yields are going to be a little bit better if you go to uniform stem. If we take a look at what we had from a survey here from a grower survey that was conducted here over a year ago, and one of the things is really point out here is what seeding rate do you use? And this was asked to a number of producers across western Canada. About 36% said about 5 pounds per acre on average. 35% were seeding at rates less than 5 pounds. The follow-up question is what plant population do you target with that seeding rate? And the average is about 9.7 plants. However, what really was interesting is that 77% answered they didn't know. And I think this is one of the things is when we're starting to deal with $7 a pound seed and the fact that we get 50% emergence, we should be knowing what we need to know about what we're doing for emergence and maximizing that dollar per acre coming. Now, this is a slide here from Murray Hartman. Uh, who's the uh, Provincial Oil Seed Specialist for Alberta Agriculture who compiled a number of trials across Western Canada uh, over a number of years and looked at plant population versus yield percentage and using what they recommended of 7 to 14 plants per square foot as sort of the check. And the big thing to point out here is 
we basically need to at least achieve five plants per square foot to really achieve the potential of a full yield or our full yield potential. The, when you take a look at it, if we're below five plants per square foot, you'll see that actually to uh, the range can be as much as 25% in yield change from the 100% line. And I think this is where some of the things that we really are risking is that if you are at four or five plants per square foot as emergence, and then we still haven't encompassed any other problems, we may be even down to one or two, but then start looking at your yield variability, how over the map it is. But you still potentially have a 25% fluctuation. When you get into that 10 plants targeted per square foot and you get up into that at emergence time, 21 days after emergence, you see that basically the yield is within always the top 10% all the time. And this is just through general plant populations, we can maximize yields. And even though we may have a little bit drier year, harsher year, by having those plants, we do have a little bit more room for error. We they have to be constantly thinking about what's happening down the road because unfortunately it would be really nice if we could just seed on May the 5th and everything comes out of the ground we don't have to worry about, but we still have to worry about frost and other little things. Because these are some of the issues that we do see every year. If you look at the left hand side of the corner, flea beetle problems. If you were starting off with three and four plants per square foot in the springtime and you have massive flea beetle pressures, you will be spraying. Uh, however, if you're at eight to ten plants and it's coming out nice and uniform and the plants are healthy and growing, you may not have to spray. And when we start looking at economic impact, every little dollar starts counting. If you look on the top right-hand corner of the picture, you'll see actually those are actually plants that are crusted. And this is some of the issues why you may never see some sometimes canola coming out of the ground. From the simple fact is that that seed comes, out of the ground, comes up, hits its head on the roof, turns back south, and never does show up. And that's where you start losing plant population. The other thing is why we always stress try to go for 10 is that sometimes you have little herbicide residues. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, this is a field that had not had a group 2 on in two years, but because of dry conditions, you can see in areas the thinning. And then when it was actually field bioassayed and we looked at the plants, there was group 2 issues. And then, of course, we always have our little other underground worms. That the reason why we never see something come out is that we may have cutworms or wireworms. And these type of uh, bugs can cause you problems. And then, of course, we have deep seeding, and we sometimes see wire stem showing up as, as a disease, and people say, well, it's because of the cold year. But if you take a look at the pictures here, you can see the function why the wire stem is there is because of the deep seeding. And sometimes you will lose some plants there, and that will thin your stem. And this is why it's better to have 10 plants at the beginning of the season versus having five, because if you start losing plants through the year. Now, under our website here, we have what we call the estimated canola populations under various seeding conditions. And what this looks at is different types of survival rates from 20 rate up to 80% using 1,000 kernel weight on the left-hand side and what seeding rates you should be used to to get into that minimum five plants per square foot. And if you bring, for example, here the 80% survival rate, you can see that basically is that it can guarantee 80% out of 5,000, which is not unheard of here today some of the newer seed varieties, some are getting up into that six range, you could get away potentially with three or four pounds per acre. But that's, again, 80%. We typically are seeing 40, 50, or 60, depending upon the season. The thing think about is that 36% of producers here in Western Canada under the survey are into this range. The concern we have here is, is that that's 80%, and we have to hope for that because at the end of the day, if they don't have that 80%, they could be not sitting at 10 or... Uh, six or five or six plants, they could be actually quite a bit less. And again, it's 80. And the next question was asked was, is that do they recalibrate between seed lots? 75% don't. And that's really an important issue because one of the things you have to be thinking about is even though you may be growing and at high top end of a variety, a hybrid, at the end of the day, what may be happening here is that you may have two different seed sizes. And if you're only half a gram per thousand, not a critical issue. But if that's if, for example, you're at a six gram per thousand in one lot, and then you're at four and a half, there's an, you have to be thinking about recalibrating. So those are things that you have to be thinking about. The other thing I need to you need to be thinking about, if you take a look at this picture here, this is actually the same variety, the same treatments, everything's been done the same, and yet we've got this visible line. And what I wanted to show here is, is that this one on the left here, this is a producer and a son farming together. The one on the left is the uh, older father buying certified seed. On the right-hand side, the son went out and took it out of the bin, cleaned it up, and seeded it. 
at the end of the day it was eight bushels an acre and on a thousand acres and it was actually earmarked for in that twelve to fourteen dollar a pound or twelve to fourteen dollar a bushel sale price he started looking at he lost over a hundred dollars an acre just because he got into what we call AC West deal rather than actually buying certified seed so even though we have higher seed prices this is something that I continue to see is, is that the certified seed is giving you a better emergence, giving you a better shot at getting out of the ground than something that you may be thinking about taking out of your bin. Herbicide issues, residues we need to be thinking about. So we need to be thinking about what's happened on that field this year that you're going to be seeing your canola on. Is there an issue? For example, have you been using a group two over a continued number of years? And now you're switching into some other system that would not be resistant, for example, going into Liberty Link or Roundup Ready. Have you had enough time elapsement? And some of those things can parlay into that is because of the dry conditions that we had here this past year. Is that is there actually been enough time to allow for the breakdown, especially if we used a couple of shots of, of the group two? Bioassay may be required, and I think it's important is that for anybody out there that has some suspected fields, it would be pretty good idea to actually get a bioassay done. The other thing you have to do is to go through your fields and figure out which fields actually did, for example, have peas on them and make sure that you don't switch up the bags at seeding time. We've had a few times here in the last year or last year where guys had grown peas the year before. They had said they were going to put Clearfield canola on there and they grew a RRLL on there and had to reseed it. So go back through your records, find out what's going on. Now this is from the Peace Country courtesy of Aaron that was out of field. This is actually herbicide carryover group two and you can see what can happen here. You can see that stunted plants, uh, the cupping, the growing points completely cupped. So those sometimes will happen. Or what you're going to see here is you're going to see this is, for example, this is seven ounces of 2,4-D phase after seeding. The reason being is the producer who did with this is that his dad for a number of years always used one or two ounces of MCPA to control volunteer canola with this spring at the time of this picture. He was trying to control um, uh, some volunteer canola, so and he figured the best way to do it would be because it was uh, RR canola and it was RR, it was canola and canola. He went in with 2,4-D and next thing you know, this is what's happened. And so here we have some canola that's basically about eight days from crop insurance day and this is, it has not moved. And so these are the damages that we have to be thinking about. Soil temperature. This is one thing is that as we're switching earlier and earlier into seeding mint till, uh, we're seeding to lower and optimal soil temperatures. And the problem with these colder soils is that we have increased need, time needed for emergence. Uh, we're increasing uh, the exposure to seedling diseases. Uh, we have impairs protein production leaves. The other thing that also happens too is, is that when your plant starts to imbibe and germinate, your seed protection, for example, your flea beetle treatment is starting to work. It's day one. And so the longer that that plant is sitting below the, the soil surface, the longer that uh, or less that seed treatment is going to be when you get above ground as far as from the flea beetles. So if you've got a 28-day protection window and it's down below the ground 14 or 15 days before it emerges, you've only got about 14 days of coverage left over. So we need to be paying attention to soil temperatures. Now this graph some of you guys have may have seen before or people in the audience, but the idea is to show that a lot of the fields in Western Canada hopefully get seeded into the three to uh, into the four to six degree soil temperature range. This is what we had hoped to be happening. You typically will see within four to seven days in that between that sixty to eighty percent germination, and hopefully that's what you'll see is some pretty well some nice even emergence occurring after. If we could convince everybody, if we could all seed everything in one day, the idea would be wait till eight degrees, and then within probably three days, you'd have close to 100% germination and emergence within a day or so after. However, as we push these soil temperatures, we are typically seeding into three and two and three degree soils. And what you can see here is, is that this is emer again germination, not emergence. That even after 10 days in the two degree soil, we're still sitting well below 40% germ. And in the uh, three degree soils, we're sitting at about 60% germination. That puts a lot of stress on plants. Uh, they're going to be fighting diseases, they're in cold soils, they're coming out real sick. And then again, because if you're sitting on the ground 10 days and it's still only 40% emergent or 40% germination, you still potentially only going to see emergence maybe three to five days later. You have that many of that days of uh, seed treatment left over, but you do see a lot of uneven emergence. And some research out of uh, Swift Current under uh, Angadi has said that this uneven emergence may be costing up to 20% of your yield in some cases on these lower plant stands. And so it's a, 
that we get out and take a look at what our soil temperatures are. Hey, Doug. So if we were thinking, yes. We just launched a quick poll to see when, how often people make, check their soil temperature to make a decision. So just bear with them a second while they vote here. Okay. You'll be happy to know that very few say never, but it's a pretty even balance between several times, sometimes, and at least once. Oh, oh okay. Rick, they, they can hear us, right, Rick? Yes, they can. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so Rick just released the poll saying some do, some don't, some not. Uh, the big thing is, is there anything about doing soil temperatures? Look at the soil temperatures average over a minimum of a three-day period. And temp should be taken at depth that inch, inch and a half, preferably an inch, at 8.30 in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason being is that you want to get the minimums and you want to get the maximums. What you want to do is average that over three days, and if you're hitting 4 and 5 degrees, it's a good starting point. Canola will imbibe water and germinate in 2 degree soils, but the metabolism growth rate will be really slow. But again, a good starting point is about 4 to 5 degrees, and then potentially if you start at that point, the majority of your acres are probably going into that 6 to 8, which is where you want to be. One of the things is that we're going to look at when it comes to soil temperatures, where is your opener sit as residue management? And as far as successful res residue management, of course it started last fall, but the idea is, is that for coming up for this fall, we need to be thinking about spreading width of your straw and your chaff should be equal with or cut of your swath or straight cut header, looking at different ways of managing that straw. The use of heavy harrows can be used to spread the straw, but be watch your aggressiveness. Uh, if you get too aggressive, you could actually break those crowns that when it comes time for seeding, you can start pulling stuff out of the ground. And so the idea being is, is that you just want to move your straw around to give you a good seed bed, but also to give you the ability to open it up. This is actually a picture from Rick Talu from when his days with RTL. You can take a look at here, as you can see, on May the 23rd. Now this is back to the three, so it is a dated picture in the sense it is old, but it still rings true. If you take a look in the black soil here on May the 23rd, it's over 30 degrees C at depth, and then you get to the straw layer at 20, so there's a 10 degree difference. And I think this is a really important point, is that as we're direct seeding, uh, we have very narrow openers, uh, we're looking at a lot of straw potentially, and with these 60 bushel canola crops, uh, and we're looking at maybe 60, 70 bushel wheat crops, 100 bushel barley crops as we get better and better into direct seeding. Straw is going to become a big issue here in chaff management. But this 10 degree soil temperature on these small seeds can make a big difference. And I think it's important that we be looking at these soil temperatures because even though you may say, well, geez, it's a warm sunny day, we should be looking at the straw. There was actually a number of fields that I looked at in late June last year where just for out of just to check, we went into actual big straw piles, and the straw layers were still reading underneath there, 8 and 9 degrees, and this is late June. And so it's important that we get out there and I think do the soil temperature test. It's just another way to maximize emergence. When we ran our production centers in um, back in the early 2000s, what we were taking a look at here is uh, we were looking at standards, or we were looking at um, canopy manipulation, so we were planting at early and late seeding dates looking at emergence, and we could see actually just emergence numbers going higher because we went into warmer soils. So it's important. It's an important tool for us. We have to be dealing with. If you take a look at this straw here, and this is a beautiful straw cover, everything's good, but you look at that now, that soil temperature in there is cool and it's very slow. You can see on the left-hand side of my finger there, you've got a small plant coming up, you've got a bigger plant there. Those could be potentially prone to frost, and that's one of the things we worry about. And it, because of the slow temperatures or the cold temperatures, it will be slower growing. So there could be some issues there. And when this is another field where we actually pulled away the straw, and you can actually see here what the damage was. Now, if you can see in the left-hand side here, the second one in, you can actually see the uh, plant isn't too bad, but you can see the other two plants actually got hit by frost. They are recovering. You can take a look at the growing point. But at the end of the day here is that Sometimes straw can be a little bit of a hindrance to you when it comes to these, especially with these nice June frosts in the last couple of years. This is to show you what opportunity or one option could be. Uh, this is from a producer from the St. Paul area. Uh, he normally bales most of the straw off. What it is, we have a local cattle producer here that bales the straw off this guy's land because uh, he needs straw for his cows. And you can see on the left-hand side, there's actually a division line where the producer said, I actually had enough straw I don't need anymore so you quit baling 
Uh, the guy uses a mid-row bander, very narrow row openers. On the right-hand side of the top part of the picture, you can see actually where we've got a nice, beautiful canola field. This is actually in August. Uh, this is the bottom stuff on the reseed is late August. We had a frost in June that basically he was forced to reseed, whereas the stuff that had been baled actually uh, was left alone because the plant populations were suitable. And at the end of the day, uh, by basically October, he had 42 plus bushels sitting in the bin, whereas he was waiting till well into November on the reseed to combine. So the one little management tool of bailing off the straw in his year's canola production because of his opener system and how narrow it is and straw issues is helping going to help him. And so one of the things is that probably you'll see more and more of he he'll be doing as he's discussed is he's going to be bailing a lot of his canola or future canola acres off of that year production. It may even not be suitable for everybody, but we have to figure out ways to open up that row to get that warmth to protect ourselves. So when we're thinking of stuff, this is probably still one of our cheapest forms of technology. It's about a buck and a half to two bucks to get one of these made, but we call this tube sock technology. Um, and this is actually a picture that Rick took with a neighbor buddy of his, and they were looking actually at peas, but this applies to canola. The idea is, is that when you're out there, you've got your drill, you're calibrating it, you're, you're checking things, you're driving down, check to see what your seed sample is doing. This is actually, uh, we call it tube sock technology, but at the end of the day, what we'll find out is what's happening to our seed. And if you take a look at the bag on the left, this is out of the bag. And on the right hand side, this is after it's gone through the system. And one of the things is, is that when you start seeing that, you know those splits are never going to germinate, it, but it's the unseen damage. And when we actually did this uh, a couple of years ago, when in the previous fall, southern Alberta had very hot, dry conditions, we had, and we knew the seed samples were really dry. We went out and collected samples, and we could see actually where germination dropped down from 92 down to 78 percent in some testings that were being done by one of the labs that we had to do them. And so what's important is that even though we see some split, it's the unseen damage that we not, may not be seeing. And so we have to be thinking is that when we're going out there with the drill, we collect that sample, we need to be thinking about, because one of the things that Rick was very famous at saying is that what's the first thing you do if you plug your drill? It's not turn back the fan or pick, uh, slow down or anything else, it's curse. And then you turn up fan speed. And it may not be that. It may be just something as simple as slowing down or in a, maybe in a double shoot system is just changing your dampering just so that you get proper. Now, the other thing is we also see this, and this is, comes down to is that shit, when we're setting our depth control, the good picture of seating depth. Uh, this is from a producer that basically the hilltops were very soft, um, when he went to seed, and you can see there that there's a lot of bare patch in the field. When we walk to field, that's basically fields being where the seed's down two and three inches. And so the idea is to calibrate, uh, when you go out and checking your depth control, you should be checking your depth consistently and different parts of the field and checking your drills. Uh, when we're taking a look at seeding depth in inches versus plants per square meter emergence, set number of seeds, you can see here that when you're on that half to one inch layer, basically 120 plants to 100 plants per square meter coming out of the ground. The interesting thing is that big drop off. As soon as you drop at a half an inch, you go from anywhere from 120 to 100 plants per square foot or per square meter right down to 60. So you can potentially lose 40% of your population by being a half inch lower. And this is really critical is that especially as we're chasing, uh, if we're chasing moisture or if it's very cold soils, these are some of the issues you have to be thinking about is that what kind of damage are we doing to emergence when it comes to is that if we are into going below that one inch layer. This is to show you what, this is actually from a fellow agronomist uh, in Manitoba, but he took these, this is half inch on the left hand side, inch and a quarter and three inches down. Inch and a quarter and half inch, quite healthy. And I'm assuming most of you guys out there would love to see the plants on the left you really don't want to be seen with those plants on the right. And that's the kind of plants that we sometimes do see is because of depth, and we have to be paying attention to those things. And of course, then this shows up. And this is what we see would happen. Sometimes you get variable emergence showing up, a lot, and sometimes it's the speed. One of the things is a lot of you guys have heard me across Western Canada, I've talked about at different meetings is slowing down. And probably this is one of the most useful charts I've probably ever developed. This is actually from a trial I did here at St. Paul, and it looked at three versus four versus five. The producer's normal seeding speed was at five miles an hour. We got them to slow down to four and to three, and you can see how the range of depth changed. And I think this is probably the more critical factor, just that one little thing.
changed. The other thing that could be seen is, is that, unfortunately, I didn't throw in the slide on, but the plant population numbers just start going up in a nice linear proportion is that as we went from five to four, plant populations went up from six to ten plants per square foot, and that's all we've done is limited our depth control. The things, too, is when you get an excessive speed in this picture here is that you'll notice that there's seed in the fertilizer roll. You've got three blue seeds there in mixed in with the fertilizer, and you've got one sitting up on the seed shelf. So when at 5.3 miles an hour, you take a look at you've got one out of four seeds within six or eight inches of each other that are actually only in the proper zone. This is actually from a fellow agronomist that used to work with us uh, that's gone on to work for another company, but Dave had tried this on his own farm because he was having emergency issues, and so he did this trial. And just by slowing down, all the seed went back up on the shelf. So it's important that we be thinking about that. Now this is from Lacombe. Lacombe is doing a bunch of work on seeding speed combined with seeding depth and they're going from the whole range from four miles an hour or they're actually doing the low and the top from four mile an hour to seven mile an hour. They're going half inch and then they're going two inches down. And the big thing to think about on this one is, is that if we take a look at this is the 50% line. You can see here is that at four miles an hour at one centimeter depth we're sitting at 50% emergence in Lacombe. And Lacombe is known as countryside where you can basically spit on it and it grows you a fantastic crop. The one thing to think about here though is that Lacombe was a very cold soils this year, uh, very cool spring, sometimes a little bit drier. So by doing four miles an hour, one centimeter, we were at 50% level. But if we bury it, if you look at your next bar over, four miles an hour, four centimeters, we're down to 26 plants. We're way less. We're at 25% emergence or less. Uh, seven miles an hour, one centimeter, we're a little bit higher, but again, the seven miles an hour is not as good as a four, but it shows you that keeping it shallow, but if you combine both depth and speed and throw that out the window, you can see how you really drop off an emergence. So when you start looking at 50% emergence at $7 a pound, you're actually, your seed's costing you basically 14 bucks. It's not $7 anymore. Now this is uh, the comb trials. Now the one thing to think about here, don't look at the bushels, just look at this is one year. But if you take a look at overall with this variety, 92 bushels when you do it right. If you go with that seven miles an hour, you lose about six to eight, or you should lose eight bushels an acre. If you look at today's economics at nine bucks, at $72 an acre, just doing one thing right. Uh, if you do the four miles an hour and bury it, uh, your losses are even worse. And the seven miles an hour at, 80, at four centimeters of 85 bushels, I don't know why it's higher than the four, but it could be some other factors involved there, and maybe it's because of the variation, variability of depth that shows up, and some of those plants potentially that were come from the shallow, from the seed bounce, and the bounce itself may be a little bit helping this out. Hard to say, can't explain it, but the idea is to look at just the fact is that by doing four miles an hour, half inch deep, we're top end yields. Now, a lot of guys are saying, well, you know, I like to slow down, I like to do different things, but I've got to get going in the ground. And I think one of the things is that if you're going to have to start seeding early this springtime and you're going to be pushing limits, you need to be thinking about something. I think the first of all is, is that you're going to be pushing the seeding date, you're going to be pushing maybe the soil temperatures. You have to look at maintaining a, a good seeding rate of at least a minimum of five pounds or maybe even boosting it. The idea is, is that if we're thinking about 50% of the seeds are actually coming out of the ground, and if we're going to push soil temperature, they may be actually 40. And so we need to be thinking about, okay, with the seed lot I have, the 1,000 kernel weight we have, what should I be seeding at? And if you're going to bank on 50% when you're going into a 2 degree soil, you probably won't get that. And so we have to be thinking about that. If you saw flea beetles in 2009, you need to be thinking about, I should be making sure I've got an extended flea beetle treatment because the idea being, again, is that you're going to be coming out of very cold soils. Uh, that seed treatment, it may take a long time to learn uh, to get out, and so your amount of level of seed treatment left over protecting these flea beetles might not be there. Uh, slowing down, it's going into that half to one inch layer. If you are going to be starting that early and pushing it early, you should be keeping it there and try to keep that as low as possible. The other thing to be thinking about, too, if it's dry, especially in that May 1st, and you're, not, you're probably better to seed shallow, don't be chasing. If you're going to chase moisture that early in the growing season, you're going to put your plants under that much more stress. Uh, you're probably going to see way less than 30 or 40% emergency, maybe down to 20%. Uh, 
thing to think about is, is that as we get later into the growing seasons, uh, our soils warm up, there may be an opportunity for you to go out and chase a little bit of moisture and making sure, because we've actually seen that research with that speed, seeding speed, seeding depth trial at, where it was done at Scott, where we had actually moisture emergence were a lot better, but again, it was seeded a little bit later. So as our soil temperatures get warm, there may be some opportunity, but the big thing is, is don't be chasing moisture early in the season. The thing is to be thinking about is that using seed place P205. Some of you guys may be using uh, Jumpstart, uh, but the big thing is even in the colder soils, you still should be using some P205 and put it in there. And finally, the last thing to be thinking about is pre-seed burn-off. Uh, get out, walk those fields, inspect them. The problem is that you have plants that are coming out of the ground very stressed, slow growing and everything else, and then if they have to start combating weeds, that's going to actually affect what happens as far as your emergence. And so the idea is, is to get that pre-seed burn done, get those plants coming out of the best possible environment possible, and take a look at just see where you're at as far as where your, your, your straw management is and your chaff management. Give this plant the best possible chance to come out of the ground. So with that, it's just sort of a quick hit update, get us thinking, get us set up and primed for the upcoming growing season and go from there. So is there questions or? Yeah, we've had a few questions come in, Doug. Just give me a second here. Uh, first question came from Layton. At what depth do you check soil temperature? Okay. Well, we check its depth of seeding, typically inch, inch and a half. Uh, and the reason being is that by the time you seed and everything else, you're probably about an inch and a half because your press roll furrow will be a little bit lower. But that's where we try to check for our depth. Uh, check the depth, basically, inch, inch and a half for soil time. Okay. A uh, question from Jason. How much difference is there in seedling vigor slash germination based on seed size? Is bigger seed size better? Well, if you go with the research that Bob Elliott did out of universe or out of Ag Can in Saskatoon, he did show that the bigger plumper seed had better vigor and better emergence patterns overall than smaller seed. Um, but you know, in some respects, it was significant. In some respects, it just showed better emergence, but just numbers-wise. But yes, a bigger plumper seed definitely will have a little better vigor and have a little better emergence rates on average. Okay, another question from Layton. Are you aware of any work looking at independent depth openers versus shank openers in terms of speed of seeding? No, I am not aware of any of that depth. Uh, or that I'm not aware of any of that research that's ongoing, but I do know there is some research that is starting up under the science clusters through Ag Canada and the Canola Council, and I believe some of the stuff that is going to be looked at is something along that lines. And, and I just comment that the egg canna stations use a conserva pack with independent depth, and they still see those effects that Doug showed yeah. where, you know, seeding too fast, uh, the depth control of the opener might be okay, but it's still the amount of soil that you're throwing over top of previously seeded rows. Yeah. Question from Barry. For 1,000 for thousand kernel count on the table, should we use 50%? Uh, if so I'm understanding about uh, mortality or something, yeah. The, what uh, what I'm thinking is, is probably looking at, yes. I'd use 50% as a rule of thumb. Uh, you know, you could use high as 60. It all depends upon on you know on what you figure your openers are like and what your soils are like and when you're going in seeding. But I would use the 50% rule. It's probably the easiest starting point. And then what I would do is 21 days after emergence, is go out there and do plant counts. And that'll give you an idea because if you use your thousand kernel weight to calculate your seeding rate and use a fifty percent rule and you get more, perfect. That tells you is that some things were things were done ex were done right. And uh you've uh, basically got an opportunity here to look at uh you know, you've hit your probably your target plant populations. Okay. Uh question from Cameron. Does the speed affect depth with an air drill with discs as much as an air hoe? Uh, I couldn't tell you that. And the reason being is, is that um, it depends on soil type. It depends upon your topography. Um, there is, I, I, you know, I, I just go as that when 
typically when I see seeding speed is an issue. Um, sometimes there's no differentiation between drills. However, I've seen where, and I've not seen, but I've actually heard of a few producers saying they have been able to get or higher seeding speeds with their disc drills. But again, their land is very flat, uh, very nice soil to be able to work with. So, But I don't know in all conditions. And, and I'll throw my old uh, reduced tillage agronomist hat on and, and agree that yes. with discs you can often go a little quicker and largely it's because uh, you're throwing less soil over top of previously seeded rows, which is where the bigger the opener, the more, the more trouble you can get into. Uh, let's see, we have a question. I just got, they're coming in pretty quick now, which is great. Uh, let's see. Question from Dan. Sure. Is rhizoctonia damping off? root rot being looked at by the breeders, resistance, or chemical companies, fungicides. Do you think Lindane was helping control this in the past? Uh, first of all, Lindane was not helping because Lindane actually is an insecticide, so it had nothing to do with Rhizoc. Uh, the chem companies are all looking at ways to improve the efficacy of their, their chemicals. Um, as far as the research, that's where up to the individual companies they'd have to say. But as far as I know, they always are looking at ways to improve it, but I don't know of any research right now. Okay, question from Andrew. When checking seed depth, do you leave the drill in the ground, stop and check right at the seed boot with it in the ground, or do you check out behind the drill in the press wheel furrow? Aaron, do you want to answer? Go ahead. You're on a roll here, buddy. Okay. Um, basically, what I like to do is stop the, if you want to get an idea potentially where your seed's at, I go right behind the boot and look for a couple of seconds. Then I walk back probably 150 feet to 200 feet behind the drill, and then I start looking in the press wheel furrow and start digging. I kind of do a forensic where I actually go across a number of rows, and I will scrape away slowly looking to see where the seed placement's at. The other option is is that when you stop your tractor, get off and walk into the previously seeded row and walk through that and start pulling apart different runs and taking a look. The biggest thing is find out which shanks are behind your tires, uh, find out which ones potentially are your back ones and take a look to see how much because you might see some difference between front and back and that comes to this front to back leveling and the amount of speed and how much the dirt throw. But you don't want to be checking right behind because typically if you stop your drill, you're already down well below three miles an hour. And of course, everything's going to be ideal. What you want to do is be going to be checking where you're normally seating at five miles an hour, wherever your seating speed is set at. Yeah, and make sure you're checking in different parts of the field because certainly headlands are, are a whole different area. Exactly. Question from Salvador. Up to how many pounds of actual P205 can be placed with the seed? Mm. If you go by the safe rates charts, uh, they're saying in some cases, depending upon your row width utilization or your SBU, you know, you can get up to 20 pounds. It could be higher, but it all depends upon soil moisture, soil type. Uh, we have a lot of guys that will go 15 to 20 pounds of the seed and not see any potential issues. But if you look at some of the research, they're saying any amount of phosphate will affect some germination. But again, it's based upon soil moisture, and it's based upon soil type and separation. There's a lot of things that will factor into that. But typically, 15 to 20 pounds is a safe bet. Okay, question from Barry. Are hilltops the best spot for a field soil bioassay? Uh, one of the areas, but what I would potentially look at is if you're going to do a field bioassay, is look at your hilltops, look at your side hills, separate out, divide that sample into three, don't mix. And, but one of probably the better people to talk to would be to get a hold of Alberta Research Council, and it's Sandy Checkel. She does their field bioassay, and she would actually have a standard protocol for doing bioassays in the field. Okay, question from Ron. Where do you get your socks for checking seed damage? Uh, where we got the socks, uh, I don't know where you got those ones, Rick, but we've actually gone to the Handicap Society and some of the smaller communities where they actually put these socks together. There's actually some places in Saskatoon, Edmonton, Lloyd Minster, um, different towns will have, and what they are is they have people that are mentally challenged or mental abilities network, and that's where we've got them sewn. But essentially they're just a, a regular sock, correct? They're just a regular sock, and the ones that you had, Rick, are basically just a regular 
little mini canvas sample bag. Yeah. If right? you're doing if you're gonna do this with peas, you need a lot bigger bag than if you're doing it with canola. Yeah. Uh, question from sure. Jordan. Does seed place sulfur damage germination or is it more the end that you have to watch out for? Uh, my experience is more of the end. However, sulfur in high amounts will still cause them because it is it's a salt. So uh, you again want, want got to watch your issue, watch that issue. Okay, and unless some more come in, I have one more question from Ronald. Okay. What is the effect of using more Roundup than recommended on Roundup ready canola? <laughs> we didn't even get into that. Uh, that's something they should be taking in, into account with uh, their Monsanto rep. But the idea is, is that typically when you go above recommended rates, you have a potential harm to put more stress on the canola crop. And I think that's the biggest thing is that we, the label rates are the label rates. If you go higher, the potential is, is that you may put some more stress onto that plant. And it may not affect the plant to the degree where it makes them sick, but it stresses them out to the point that it sets them back by a couple of days. Because you got to remember, the Roundup has got to be metabolized by the plant. During that metabolization period, it lets other things go. And the effect probably are more visible as you get later, closer to bolting and early flower that any herbicide application, whether it's Clearfield, Liberty, or Roundup, has the a potential to knock some flower buds off because a plant will potentially say, no, we'll put some more flowers out later. We need to metabolize that. Okay, well, that looks like a wrap on the questions for today. Perfect. So once again, thank you, Doug and Aaron, for your time this morning, and thank you to everyone who joined. Again, just to remind you, with our webinars, all the information that you need about our webinars is at canola.ab.ca. Sign up for our newsletter. Keep an eye on our coming events or watch the webinars online. Uh, there will be a short poll that pops up or a survey at the end. We really appreciate if you answer those few questions because we're always looking for ideas or suggestions for improvements on doing these webinars and making them even more valuable to those of you that have joined us from uh, not only in Alberta today, but across Canada and in other countries as well. So with that, I'm going to sign off and thank you all for joining us today on behalf of the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. Have a great day.